Hello, so this video is going to be a bit of a run from my experience doing HEMA and it's something that uh, I think is, is going to be a very good informal point. Um, from my experience of people doing Fiore, people don't know how to do Fiore because people don't read the treatises themselves. I had this problem when I used to do HEMA at the club uh, with the person teaching who didn't even read the treatise himself. And I had to bring in the treatise uh, for that person. Um, but there were some weird interpretations of HEMA, like deflecting shots. Like you deflect it like this, which is, is absolute nonsense. Um, the way you deflect in, in Fure is that you kind of just hit away with it. You see that in Japanese, Kenjutsu sparring, any sort of sword fighting which you have a rebat or a deflection. If I want to diagonal step as well, I do that. I've deflected the person's blade. But um, that's one example of uh, Fiore. There are some things in Fiore which people just don't understand. There are some myths and jokes which have um, kind of permeated and propagated as a result of people not reading Fiore and not studying it. Now, I'm going to go into Fiore's longsword mainly because. Um, that's what I learned. I didn't really read much of his other stuff because it's not relevant to me. Um, my, my, the relevant point of my interest and what I was studying was Fiore's longsword. So let's go into some of the myths of Fiore and the stuff that people just don't understand or the stereotypes. First one is, Fiore only traverse steps. That's wrong. Not only is that wrong, that's entirely devolved of the system that Fiore taught. Fiore has a number of uh, different parts of footwork from his long plays, from what he hints at, um, from his katas, because he has two katas or sword combination forms that he does in his treatise. He has what we'd consider shuffle stepping. So if I do it sideways, it's where one foot's in front of the other and shuffling forwards. He has what people would rightly point out to be traverse stepping. One foot in front of the other. Which is really good for going in close and getting into grappling. He also has other ones as well. He has what's called an L step. Where the front foot will go forward diagonally. The rear foot will go to the side. It's almost like it's forming an L. So if I want to rebat something out of the way, my, my foot almost does this diagonal step and the rear foot comes in like an L. Sorry, excuse me. There is a whole thing called Fure's long plays that Fure does. That people maybe in the UK just don't seem to understand or the club that I went to anyway doesn't seem to understand. There is a number of implications that can be done with those different steps. And the brilliant thing about Fiore is he doesn't say which footwork to use in which situation. And it's kind of inferred that you can use any of this, these types of footworks in any situation. There was one more that I did forget, which is kind of the, the 180 degree kind of... Um, like semicircular step. It's kind of like if you've seen John Wayne when he kind of moves like this. It's almost like a semicircular half circle step. Fury does that as well, and that's um, that's practically useful for a number of reasons as well. The, the first one is it enables you to wind up the strike before you're going to do it. If you really need to uh, cut the other person's blade out of the way because they're coming into you with a very strong thrust that's a very good way to do it especially moving off the center line as well so there that's one of the that's an, one gripe that I have for people who do Fure yes there's a stereotype that Fure is about getting in close and grappling well no he, he doesn't. He has this whole long play that's dedicated to 
not getting in close. There is some stuff he does which you go where you go in close, which is like a feint. For example, he does horizontal cut, and then he'll do another one where you step in and you go into uh, half sorting. And with that, and the way you counter that is you do exactly the same. You do a you do a step into half sorting as well. People don't understand this, and from what I've seen anyway. And it's very frustrating to see because it, it propagates a lot of stereotypes about Fury style of fencing, which certainly isn't true. Um, and there's a lot of nuances as well with Fury's long place that doesn't involve grappling. There's plenty of them. There's, there's, a, there's an inexhaustible amount of nuances of long plays that just don't get talked about with Fury. So the first one is is that um, doing a bind. So you, you're putting uh, your sword to the center line against theirs. And if the opponent's bind is weak, you can come in and thrust. If the opponent's bind is strong, you come around and you strike the hands. Uh, another one would be the horned guard. This one. Fure says that the horn guard is very good, and I'll use an example because it's a lot. You can do what you can do in the long guard, which is this, and you can do the same moves. And one of the things that he talks about in the long guard that you can do is you can prod and tempt your opponent to attack, and then when they do attack, you can bring back the blade and strike. Fury says you can do this with uh, the, the horn guard or twin horn guard or whatever it's called, which is this guard, and you can prod and you can tempt, and then you can, when the person gets tempted enough that they strike, you can turn this into a strike by twisting the hands and striking the head. So there are a lot of nuances in Fury that people don't talk about. Um, and I think it's a carryover from German fencing. I don't read a lot of German fencing. I don't read a lot of Lichtenhauer. I don't read a lot of Sigmund Ringeck. Um, I don't read a lot of Meyer. I don't read a lot of Tauhofer, though arguably Tauhofer is difficult to read because it's a bunch of pictures. The, I, I don't have no understanding about it. I have little understanding about it. One understanding I do have about it in German fencing is the German fencing talks a lot about stepping into cut. So you're basically cross-cutting, but you're stepping into it when you do go for a cut. So if I'm in, I don't know, like this, and somebody's attacking, I step into cut, and then I do a cut. Or I step into cut, and then I just work out, or whatever you want to do. Um, because that's the way that the, the basics of German a long sword fencing from what I've seen is operates but there seems to be a carryover with Fiore well there seems to be an implication that Fiore and Lichtenhauer are similar fencing systems when they're not they're actually quite different from each other they might they might be superficially similar or I haven't read enough Lichtenhauer so maybe I don't know and I'm, I'm I, I welcome people to correct me on this and maybe they do look the same when you see them both in action, how they're intended. But there seems to just be this carryover. And you see this in the HEMA community because there's this almost uniform way of moving that has developed in the HEMA community. That's very sanitized, a very wishy-washy, a flowing type of movement that is very modern. But I don't think... the it was not the way that people in the past would have moved anyway. And if you go by what the treatises say, for example, with Fiore, you begin to get an animation of how people move um, if you understand what the movements mean. If you understand what this kind of L-stepping means, this diagonal stepping means, this kind of shuffle stepping means, what traverse stepping means, it's all. it all begins to make sense. The dots become aligned, the gaps begin to be filled. But I think it's this carryover from uh, Lichtenhauer or the German fencing tradition where they they primarily advise that you, you step into strikes. Now, I might be wrong about that. That's my understanding about it. 
but because German longsword fencing or German fence, this German schools of fencing, kind of the late Tanawa tradition has had such a impact on Hema, uh, historical European martial arts. It's had this carryover onto different um, into different styles, or mainly the Fure one, which it otherwise shouldn't have had. Because Fure, from what I understand, fences differently from Lichtenauer. Um, like, I think it's just, um, you know, the meta stuff is similar, but the, uh, the, the mechanics and stuff and the way you operate with it is different. And because mainly the different contextually, there are different time period as well. Um, so Fure is going to be the 14th century to the end of the 14th century. Uh, Lichtenhauer with Sigmund and Ringek is going to be uh, in the 15th century as well. Um, and they're, they're different activities as well. So Fure is teaching for the barrier. He is teaching you armoured sparring uh, so that you can fence other people in armour. He also says that you can do it unarmoured as well. But the implication of what Fure says when he says, like, I fought five times with nothing but a padded jacket and leather gloves and I quit myself honourably and without injury to myself, well, what does that mean? We don't know what it means. Um, does it mean that you fence somebody and it looked good enough that honour was fulfilled? I don't... I, I have an inclination to think that it's not a fight to the death. Um, fight to the death in the medieval period by this time... Um, you know, might have happened, but I'm not sure if it was the dominant thing. Um, what was I saying? So yeah, uh, whereas my understanding of German fencing is, it is based on like a, a burger, so middle class uh, style of activity fencing. You'd have people trained for the militias, um, who'd be part of the town watch and stuff like that who'd be part of mercenary companies uh, as the Renaissance kind of went, uh, gradually progressed. Um, you know, that I'm not sure if there's part of the knightly element to it as well, but certainly um, by the people who were writing about Lichtenhauer, like Sigmund Ringek, um, you know, Maya. Maya's living in a time where uh, you have the burger car class, you're kind of in full swing, the merchant class, and then you also have the um, mercenaries are in full swing as well. So I might be, I, I think I'm right about um, uh, Maya, but I don't think, I might not be right about Ringek. Uh, anybody who wants to correct me can correct me. That's, that's absolutely fine. But I just think there's been this kind of takeaway from German fencing, which has had its impact on Fure as well, and it's propagated certain stereotypes about Fure which aren't true, because Fure is quite a sophisticated system. It has a lot of attributes which make it sophisticated, and the brilliant thing about Fure is it's very easy to pick up and learn because it gives you a bunch of plays um, which are specific, but which when you do them, there's rule for improvisation um, or intermingling between both or some level of using your initiative as well. So that's kind of my rant about Fure. I think I think that people in the past who have read Fure, who I've seen anyway, maybe this is a London thing, haven't read it properly. Um, I was around people who didn't read Fure properly, uh, kind of on my own head, at my own behest. And I think it's something which needs to be taken away and I think the, the key thing going forward is people need to read the material rather than learning on the people. It's a modern martial art HEMA because it reconstructs, there aren't living lineages anymore so you have to make do with um, what the material says and the brilliant thing about that is you're learning from a master because they wrote their notes down to you so that's what's good about it. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you very much.